Eureka by John Thomas, Volume 1 Chapter 2 Epistles to the Four Angel Stars of the Ecclesias in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. Section 1 To the Angel of the Ephesian Ecclesia To the Angel of the Ephesian Ecclesia write, These things saith he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, walking in the midst of seven lightstands, which are golden. I have known thy works and thy labour, and thine awaiting, and that thou art not able to endure wicked men, and hast tried them who assert that they are apostles, but are not, and hast found them liars, and thou hast suffered, and hast patient endurance, and thou hast laboured on account of my name, and hast not tired out, But I have against thee, that thou hast forsaken thy first love. Remember then, from whence thou hast fallen, and change thy mind, and do the first works. But if not, I come to thee speedily, and I will remove thy lightstand out of its place, except thou change thy mind. But thou hast this, that thou hatest the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hearken to what the Spirit saith to the Ecclesias. To him that overcomes, to him I will give to eat of the wood of the life, which is in the midst of the paradise of the deity. Verses 1 to 7. The Ephesian Ecclesia was the body of Christ in the city of Ephesus. This city was the metropolis of the Lydian Asia. According to Strabo, it was one of the best and most glorious of cities, and the greatest emporium of the proper Asia. It is called by Pliny one of the eyes of Asia, Smyrna being the other. But now it is venerable for nothing but the ruins of palaces, temples, and amphitheatres. It is called by the Turks Ajasaluk, or the Temple of the Moon, from the magnificent structure formerly dedicated to Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. In after times, the temples were represented by spiritual bazaars called churches dedicated to guardian saints, styled St. John, St. Mark, and St. Paul. That dedicated to St. Paul is wholly destroyed. The little that remains of St. Mark's is nodding to ruin. The only one remaining is St. John's, which is now converted into a Turkish mosque. The whole town is nothing but a habitation for herdsmen and farmers, living in low and humble cottages of dirt, sheltered from the extremities of weather by the mighty masses of ruinous walls, the pride and ostentation of former days, and the emblem in these of the frailty of the world and the transient vanity of human glory. All the inhabitants of this once famous city amount now to not above forty or fifty families of Turks, The light has gone out, and darkness is complete. The gospel appears to have been introduced into Ephesus by Paul, who, on his arrival there, went into the synagogue of the Jews, according to his usual practice, and reasoned with them. After he left, Apollos visited the city, proclaiming the doctrine of John the Baptist, but he was far behind the times. Paul's Christian friends, Aquila and Priscilla, hearing him in the synagogue, formed an acquaintance with him, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Having been thus set right by them, he went to work in the right direction, and mightily convinced the Jews in public, 
showing them by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Apollos having left, Paul returned and found there certain disciples who knew only what John the Immerser had taught. They had been immersed upon the faith of the near coming of the Christ, but were not aware that Jesus was he. Paul, having rectified their faith, re-immersed them, and then, having laid his hands upon them, Holy Spirit came upon them, and the twelve men spake with tongues and prophesied, and became a star of light to Ephesus. This was the beginning of the ecclesia in Ephesus. The fact of their being endowed with the power of speaking foreign languages and of their being able to speak to edification, which all could who had the gift of prophesying, is proof sufficient that they became co-laborers with Paul in sounding out the invitation to partake in the kingdom and glory of deity. Having strengthened himself with these, he spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. After this, he separated the disciples into a distinct congregation and continued his disputations daily for about two years, so that all they that dwelt in the proconsular or Lydian Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. By this time, the number of the faithful had greatly increased, for many who believed came and confessed and showed their deeds and burned their books of magic to the value of 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The Angels of the Ecclesias Thus was the one body created in Ephesus. It became a light stand, and the Holy Spirit bestowed through the laying on of Paul's hands a light shining from its eldership, the members in particular, for the illumination of the surrounding darkness. We need not here repeat what has been already said about the light stands and stars on page 161. Suffice it to remind the reader that the presbytery anointed with Holy Spirit was the particular star of the Ephesian Ecclesia, and consequently the angel of the body here. It was to the angel that the writing was addressed. This word was appropriately used for the presbytery of an apostolic ecclesia, as already shown in the place referred to above. It does not indicate one man, as clerical commentators suppose, who can see nothing sparkling as a bright particular star in what they call a church, but the dark body that ordinarily aims at starring it behind a velvet cushion. I say dark body, for what else is a blind leader of the blind into the ditch of perdition? The spiritual guides accepted of the people are the blind Pharisees of our day, whose light within is the darkness of a Christendom, apocalyptically designated the Great City, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Revelation 11 verse 8. The writing before us, which contains what the Spirit saith to the Ecclesias, is not spoken to papistical and protestant churches through their priestly and clerical or ministerial angels. It is spoken neither to their churches nor to their angels, for these all belong to the party of the power apocalyptically styled the dragon and his angels, and by Jesus the devil and his angels. Revelation 12, verses 7 and 4, and Matthew 25, verse 41. They pertain to the dragon's tail, 
which draws after it the stars of the heaven of this evil world. No, the writing before us contains what the Spirit saith to the servants of the deity, to them of the party of Michael and his angels, to them who have believed and obeyed the gospel, and are intelligently and faithfully waiting for the kingdom and glory of which it treats, and which are symbolised in the glorious book. When Paul was on his way from Macedonia to Jerusalem, where he desired to be on the day of Pentecost, he halted at Miletus, a city and seaport of Caria, about 36 miles south of Ephesus, waiting for the star angel of Ephesus to meet him there. In Acts 20 verse 17, this star angel is styled Hoi Presbyteroi Tes Ecclesias, the presbyters or elders of the ecclesia. When they arrived, he rehearsed what he had done while a resident with them, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of the deity. He reminded them of the persecutions he had endured, and told them that he kept back nothing that was profitable, testifying both to Jews and Gentiles, change of mind concerning the deity, and faith concerning the anointed Jesus our Lord. This was the result he aimed to produce by his disputations and persuasions in connection with the kingdom. First, to give them correct ideas of the deity and his promises. Next, to work faith in them concerning Jesus and the things pertaining to him, as the propitiatory set forth for a covering of sin. Romans 3 verse 25 This he styled, testifying the gospel of the grace of the deity, preaching his kingdom, and declaring all his counsel, from all which it is evident that Paul's teaching and course of public ministration are not those of the angels of Satan's synagogue, who deceive the whole world in its present constitution. These neither know God, nor the gospel of the grace of God, and do not, therefore, nor can they, declare his counsel. All these things the star angel of Ephesus was well versed in, for they showed their approval of what Paul said by their overflowing sympathy with him at the parting hour. But while he reminded them of the past, he forewarned them of the calamitous future, about which he was much troubled. For he perceived that on every side the hidden principle of lawlessness was already at work in and among the ecclesias. He therefore forewarned the star angel that he might be forearmed. Hence addressing him, he said, Seeing that such have been my labours among you, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock, N O, in which the Holy Spirit appointed you episcopoi, overseers, to shepherdise the ecclesia of the deity, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Yea, of your own selves will men stand up, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. This was the last interview Paul had with the Ephesian brethren, whose first works are approved by the Spirit in this apocalyptic epistle. Paul afterwards wrote to them the epistle to the Ephesians, in which he told them that he was then an ambassador in bonds, being the prisoner of the anointed Jesus for you Gentiles. The Jews had effected his arrest by the Romans, before whose emperor 
he afterwards appeared and was sentenced to lose his life. He was victimized by them because he declared that the Lord Jesus had sent him to the Gentiles. Acts 22 verse 21 For this cause he styled himself the prisoner of the anointed Jesus for the Gentiles, whether in Ephesus or elsewhere.